Wendy T. How many people call you Wendy Ty? Everybody. <laughs> I, I read it that way too until I saw how you wrote the pronunciation. In my signature block, yeah. Yes, follow-up question. Have you ever thought about making your own tea? Oh gosh, you know, I had like, I did like this um, Hope, do you know Hope Skibitsky? Um, She was like, you know what you need to do on LinkedIn, tea time with Wendy T, you know? So I- That would be amazing. Uh, right, so yeah. And I, I've never had coffee. Like I've never had a cup of coffee. So, and I'm a tea drinker. So I'm like, that's perfect. <laughs> I mean, if you love tea that much, you have the best last name ever. Right. What's up, everyone? Josh White here, back with another phenomenal episode for you. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I have been posting back-to-back -back weeks. Not every two weeks, but back-to-back -back weeks. And that is tough. But I want to thank you because the downloads have been going through the roof and the support that y'all have been sharing with me and for me has just been astounding. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Wendy T. With her extensive experience and passion for serving the military community, Wendy is the ideal candidate to fulfill the objective of providing information, services, and updates on military and veteran-related programs. Having served nine years as a first sergeant, nine years, and retiring as a chief, Wendy understands the unique challenges and needs faced by enlisted members and their families today. You see, her dedication to serving all ranks and all services sets her apart. Wendy has a proven track record of building relationships and facilitating communication, as demonstrated by her previous role on the Air Force Sergeants Association International Board of Directors. Let's head in the right direction, and most importantly, let's get after it. Okay, so the Hero's Gauntlet, this is the questions that I prepared for you, okay? And oh. and you okay. picked the topics, but I didn't tell you about these questions. I'm trying to catch you off guard. You know what I mean? Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so question one, have you found your purpose in this life? Uh, gosh, I don't know if I found my purpose, but I know what I'm good at. I mean, that's a start. What are you good at? Right. Like I'm good at helping people through their hard things. Really? Yeah. You know, cause I think because people tell me what their hard things are, right. I lower that bar or that barrier really well. And so, you know, you can help people with, with their hard thing when you know what it is. And so it's easier for people to tell me what it is just because I think like I'm, I'm approachable and also I've had lots of hard things. So. <laughs> right. Yes. You can. Speak from experience there. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I just think like it's like half the battle is just knowing what somebody's going through. And then like I can connect the dots to the resource that will be helpful for that situation. So, um, you know, if nobody wants to say this is the thing I'm struggling with because hard things are hard. Right. And so, um, when, I don't know, I just, I, I have this great ability to develop trust and rapport easily with most people, maybe not with everybody, but with a lot of people and, and that really sticks. And so sometimes I don't even know the people, but my reputation has been really solid. And so it'll be somebody who just by association will reach out and say, I've got this and I can tell they're having a hard time trying to explain it. And I'm like, okay, well, let's we'll just do a hypothetical, right? Well, hypothetically, what is going on? And they walk me through this like difficult situation that they're in that maybe isn't even about them. It's like their leadership, right? And so then I'm trying to piece together the things. And sometimes we're working with environments where like leadership is, um, doesn't always have like great integrity, right? And so- mm -hmm. So then I'm trying to put pieces together of how does this person that doesn't even know me, like, you know, is now trusting me with this hard thing that they're dealing with. Right. And, and so like, how do I help them walk through this thing that's hard for them? That's impeding their ability to be great, you know, to, to focus on what they're supposed to be doing every day. And I care about that because I care about people being able to, you know, especially in the profession of arms, do our nation's work. Um, and, you know, when we're distracted with 8 million other things, it's hard to do that. And so I want people to be great at what they're charged to do. Um, so for me, 
like, it's easy. Let's just get to it, you know? And so I want to be able to like remove those barriers faster. And we get to that by like, let's developing the trust and rapport with ease. And for whatever reason, I can get to it pretty quick. I think it, it, you just give the impression that you care for one, just the, like, I mean, when I first met you, I felt like th- that you knew me forever, but we just, inf- we actually just met, but I was like, why am I so like, I feel like I've just known this person forever because like, you just give that vibe of like putting people at ease, I think. So if somebody was talking to me about like, I, I, I mean, I work really hard at being there. And uh, I was thinking a lot about that. And I think because there has, there have been times where leaders have not been there for me and that hurt a lot. And I think because that hurt me so badly, I just refuse to let that happen to somebody. And so I just, you know, I don't want people to feel like that, you know? And so Mm. um, I think that's one of the reasons why I feel like I work really hard about, you know, about making sure people feel cared about because I don't want anybody to feel alone in that walk, you know, right. and your hard things are hard. Like I said, you know, like if you're, if you don't have any money in your bank account, nobody wants to say that out loud, you know, right? nobody wants to say how much they weigh, you know, like every example I ever see about hard things, we always say it's like this junior airman that doesn't have money. That's just not reality. It's like, it's the senior NCO or it's a major, you know, it's, it's, you know, real life happens to people that are supposed to have it together, you know? And, and mm-hmm. so then it just becomes hard to t- talk about it because people think they're supposed to not have problems, you know? And right. so, you know, I just, I want to know about your digestive issues and that kind of thing. <laughs> so <laughs> You could have gave all the examples in the world. We just honed in on, on digestive right? issues. Okay. <laughs> Well, this, see, this is how well I know you. This leads to my second question, which is what makes you so likable? But you might've already answered that. Oh, uh, everyone likes you. Everyone who I, if I ever bring you up, the person lights up and they're like, oh my gosh, yeah, she's amazing. So like not, I mean, that's pretty rare to get that reaction from so many people. I I do feel like. So how, how did that happen? Let me in on that. I do feel like the Jennifer Garner of the, you know, DOD, right? Like I feel very loved. I just had my retirement ceremony and I'll tell you like that room felt like it was filled with love. And I'm really proud of the Mm. fact that I, you know, I feel like I made it as a senior leader and I didn't have to change who I was like nobody on the street is going to walk down the street and be like, Oh, she's in the military. You know, like you would not look at me and think that. Um, and I, one of the people that attended my ceremony, she brought her three daughters and she told me afterward that she was really proud to have her family see a leader who was successful, who kind of carved the path a little differently, you know? Um, and I never really thought about it like that until she told me. And so I've had, you know, several weeks now to think about that. And I think it's because I've just had some great leaders who have supported me. You know, I've had the Hope Skibitskis, I've had the Josh Tidwells, you know, I've had these great people around me who have encouraged me to be who I am, you know, and to hug all the faces. And so I think that I work really hard and, um, but I've done, I've worked really hard at like the things that I do. Right. And so I don't know. And so I just always surrounded by great cheerleaders too. (laughs) So it sounds like you really leaned into what makes you, you, what brings you joy and what your strengths are. And instead of molding yourself to what you think success looks like. I will tell you, people were really worried for me. I mean, my, I started my career in the Navy and my first command was, um, at, I was in school at nuclear power school. And when I graduated the, um, it's the CMC, the command master chief, kind of like the command chief was very concerned about me because like, I'm an estrogen bomb, like, you know, the, the, the tears spilling everywhere of like every, I'm so delicate, right. The sky is blue. And I'm like, (gasps) you know, (laughs) so they're like, you're not tough enough. You're not mean enough. You're not for fact. And so, uh, and that's just been my whole career, you know, and there I am in Saudi Arabia and thinking like, they're going to eat me alive out here. But it was great. You know, it was just such a wonderful experience. And I, again, got to be who I am. You know, I wasn't like 
nobody's going to describe me as overly directive. Now, even though I can do that, it just takes so much out of me to like be that person, you know, like, so if Mm -hmm. I have to like pull that out, um, but I don't know. So I, I I just feel fortunate. I think people match my effort level, you know, Mm -hmm. because they see that I care a lot. And so then people, you know, match They meet you in the middle. Yeah. So I've been really, I love that. Um, and I love that you didn't, you know, you hung in there, although you probably had some people saying, Hey, you know, you're super nice and emotional, but you know, hide that. I'm sure they've told you something along that line. And oh my gosh, I I don't know that that's true. I think it was more like, um, like Cal was our scheduler at the senior NCO Academy. And when he PCS, the person that came in behind him, he was like, Wendy takes care of like all these details, take care of Wendy and always have a box of tissues. <laughs> Fact. I love that. Um, and so I'm kind of the same way. Like I've always been the oddball, like the different person. I've all, you know what I mean? And I always thought I wouldn't, I just assumed I would never make it in the military. I mean, after like my second base, I was like, I'm not, this isn't for me. Like I'm, I'm not successful in this. But I hung in there, um, and eventually my strengths kind of revealed themselves. And similarly to you, I leaned into them instead of like trying to hide them or not utilize them. Um, so although I am the oddball, uh, I've made it work for me, and I'm much happier now that I've leaned into that. Right, right. I think um, AJ Kale was in one of my classes, and he talked a lot about like, you know, rather than just trying to work on your weaknesses all the time, you know, like hone your strengths, own them and to be aware of the gaps that you have. And, you know, and I, I thought that was wise. I kind of think that we spend so much time talking about the thing, the gaps that we need to fill. And, and sometimes it's just like, be great at what you're great at. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a different approach, but it does work. Um, okay. So question number three, and you're doing great. This one's a little harder though. Okay. Okay. What was the most trying time in your career and how did you get past it? Okay. Uh, so I would say there were, I can think of two, two times where leadership failed me and those were difficult for me. Um, I feel like at the time I was the first time where I was a senior master sergeant, first sergeant, I feel like I was successful and credible and I came to leadership with a pretty significant problem and, um, I didn't get help. And so that was really hard for me. And, um, D booth, if you don't know who he is, he teaches this phenomenal course on emotional intelligence. He talks about when you lose things that are um, important to you, like your rational thinking starts to deteriorate quickly. And I walked out of that meeting, um, thinking, some pretty like crazy thoughts at the time <laughs> that weren't true. But in that time when my rational thinking was gone, I just like, I mean, my security felt threatened and, um, you know, I felt a little helpless. Um, and that really cracked my confidence and it took a long time for me, like to kind of like work through that. Uh, fortunately I had some other leadership that kind of like helped me navigate the immediate resolutions. Um, And then when that situation was kind of like finally getting some resolution, um, which took a long time, I had a commander that wasn't that supportive during that kind of difficult time um, and felt like I was being a little bit dramatic about how hard it was. And so those were, those were hard times. I think what, you know, sometimes like when they say people are going through hard things, you don't know what people are going through. Um, Those were particularly hard times for me. And I'm grateful that I had phenomenal friends who helped me through them. Um, I I had leaders who failed me and that was pretty hard on me because I felt like I'm a really successful airman. And why am I not getting the help from the people that I expect to help me? You know, like you've poured into all these people, you've been there for so many people. And then the time comes where you need help and, and you're assuming you know, with your track record, you're going to get that help. Yeah. You have no doubt about it. And then when that comes and then they don't do it, you're like, I don't deserve this. Like what is happening? I don't think I thought that. I think I questioned my own credibility and Mm. that's what made me 
that's what made me feel like my confidence was just kind of like shaken, you know? And so um, it really kind of like, I think like that, that weight made me work so hard. Like um, I would say before all of that, like difficult stuff happened, I felt like I could run small countries, you know? And like, if you look at how I was working, even just like at my time at the Pentagon, I was still running those small countries, but it was like, I was, it'd be like, if you're driving from LA to New York, but you're driving in first gear, you know, so you're still going to get there, but it's really hard on your engine, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, I was still getting all that work done, but it was just so hard on me. And I knew at that point, like, I just, I, I don't think I can take on more jobs, even though I was being vectored for other things. I was like, this is just, it's really hard on me. And I needed to spend some time. Like it was time for me just to, you know, be retired and start doing some things that were going to be like really healthy for me to like work on that own, my own self-confidence because, um, I, I didn't really take that time to do that to rebuild after I had some people that I just let it get to my head, you know? And, and what I did was channel that into work harder, you know? And I right. don't, I don't blame them because, you know, they have a perception of how things are and whatnot. So it's, it's not, it, it was how I responded to that. Right. And so I think those were the hard things. That was probably the hardest thing that I had to work through was how I responded to that feedback. Yeah. Questioning yourself and not being, you know, losing that certainty. I mean, that's terrifying. Yeah. That is a, just a, an awful feeling. Um, but I'm glad to see that you got through it. Any tips on how to, how to get through something like that? So I think like there's, a, there's a lot of, a lot of things. Um, <laughs> I used to joke that um, I had three ways with Ben and Jerry's you know, so, <laughs> so my, I've never heard that, but I'm putting it on a t-shirt, but go right. continue. So my pro tip is like, you know, like work really hard to make choices that are value added, you know? So like, I, I tried to do that because, you know, I worked at like process my difficult stuff, um, and, and go to school process my difficult stuff and, you know, work out, process my difficult stuff and volunteer. I did a lot of volunteer work because that I feel like volunteering is like so helpful for perspective. So, um, you know, try and choose value added activities because I think that, um, it'd be really easy to choose activities that are like not going to help me get through that processing time and be better. So, um, you know, and then again, incredible friends that kind of like, tried really hard to be supportive of me and also, um, remind me who I am. So, no, I love that. That's amazing advice. Yeah. And okay. I, you know, I, I frequently thank, thank, uh, AFSA because they gave me a lot of opportunity and they're the organization that like really stood by me through the entire difficult time. It's so like, if you, if you see, I'm very dedicated to AFSA because like that was the one family that I had that like stuck by me through all of it. And I've heard a lot of people say that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm blessed to have, uh, you know, been a part of it myself. Um, so this is, you, you passed the hero's gauntlet, you did phenomenal. <laughs> okay. but I always ask this bonus question to airmen. Okay. And that bonus question is what was your proudest air force moment? The moment in your career where you're like, man, like I, I am just like, it just hit the mark for you and you never forgot it. So um, I think it's the, it, it's not like a specific one. It's, it's the fact that like, I know people and their families, you know? And so um, I, 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 I recently had this question. So I had a, a second to think about it. Right. And so um, when I was TDY, this was some time ago, um, I was TDY somewhere and somebody's one of my airmen, he had later made chief, um, his wife called me and she said, Tony has to have heart surgery and we've PCS to this new location. We don't know anybody here. Um, will you come out and watch the girl so I can be there for his surgery? You know? And so I'm thinking like, if I haven't been there for a sergeant in years. So like they, wow. if, if they're calling me, they'd have nobody to call. Right. And so I took personal leave and I flew out there and I watched the girls and, you know, I even drove them out to the hospital and whatnot, you know, cause it was like, it was probably an hour and a half away. So it wasn't like, it was like right there on base and she could just be there. Um, but I've had a lot of those kind of moments where, um, 
literally right now, I have a friend who um, I used to work with who he is, he is now retired, but he was on a business trip. His family went with him on the business trip and his wife sent me a message and said, um, Jacob is in the ER, his appendix burst. Um, and so we're trying to figure out blah, 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 all these things. Um, and then Ryan sends me the text message. We're in the ambulance right now. I'm in the ambulance right now. And so I'm like, yep, I'm tracking Stephanie already sent me the message. Right. So it's like families actually know me. Right. And so I was like, I will go get the girls if I need to get the girls. Like, you know, like, like, I feel very proud that I didn't just know the airmen. Like I know their families and they trust me. Right. Mm. I'm very, that's where I feel like I did it right. You know, like I, I, I know I care about people, but I didn't just care about people for the job. I really have depth in all of those relationships. Wow. So, um, and I have, I have so many of those examples, like, not that I feel like, I mean, I certainly don't play God, but, um, you know, I still get all the, the birthday cards, the Christmas cards. Um, the Shuttler family has baby twins. There was this whole situation. There was all this stress. And, you know, I, I gave some advice because, you know, I feel like in the grand scheme of priorities, like, I feel like I got that right. You so, did. I think you're one of a kind, actually. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Just from what I, what I know about you and from what other people, like I said, how they react when your name gets brought up, I think you truly are one of a kind. So I'm blessed to, to call you a friend as well. I just, I don't know. I feel, I feel like they're, you know, I mean, these are people who made me feel like family. I never have spent a holiday alone. I mean, I've been on a million different locations and assignments and whatnot. And as a single woman, I've always had a home to go to for every holiday, you know? And so they really are my family. I was at a restaurant in the middle of nowhere and I'm sitting talking with my, my parents were with me and uh, I'm like all animated in my talking. And all of a sudden I see this little girl, like, <laughs> and she was like, I think that's my dad's friend. <laughs> She's in middle school, you know, <laughs> she recognized you. Yes. <laughs> that is wow. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag air force famous. Um, okay. No, I love that. Okay. Now you've officially passed the hero's gone. Like congratulations. You went through the easy ones, the emotional ones, the tough ones, and they were all amazing answers. So thank you for the transparency. And here's the topics, topics that we selected. The first one is lessons learned from your time in the Pentagon, which that's pretty fascinating. Can't wait to hear about that. Uh, topic two, pro tips for transition out of the military. You know, I'm interested in that. Mm -hmm. And topic three your involvement with AFSA. So we're, we're going to start with the first one, some lessons learned from your time in the Pentagon. Is that like a different beast over there? Is that like a different oh, world? Gosh. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I visited like the there Pentagon. as a master sergeant and I was the lowest ranking there. I don't know how that happened, but it was true. I was like, what? I'm basically an airman basic here. It's, I mean, I don't know how people afford to live there, right? I just, you know, I lived right across the street because I don't like to drive. And I was like, I don't, how do people live here? Um, it's just, it's, it is, and it's enormous. So, uh, I think that I will narrow this down to just, you know, my portfolio area, um, over in MR, because most people don't know what MR is, although you just had Mr. Wagner on your podcast. And so like yes. gave this great overview of MR, right. So I, that was very impressive. Um, I just kind of want to like hit like a highlights reel of the MRB because, um, some of the things that I think that I wish that I had known about to better take care of our service members really land in their AOR. And so um, I'll just hit a couple of highlights that I think um, like your listeners probably, you know, if, if they have airmen that they take care of, then they should know. So I often ask people when I get to do the briefing to kind of cover all of MR, um, like if you've ever PCS'd, and then, you know, try to get your finance stuff right with like your housing allowance. If you've ever known somebody who struggled with that, then MRB is some, some place that you should know. Because let's say, for example, you go, you try to adjust your BAH, you go, you try and adjust your BAH, and this goes on for months and months and months. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, here's your bill because we've overpaid you this many times. Um, you can actually request for that to be remitted. Oh, wow. 
because you did your part correctly and the Air Force did it wrong. Well, I mean, we've always been told like, you know, we should know better at the end of the day and it's our fault. So I didn't, I didn't know there was a, you know, a way to, um, you know, reverse that. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's, it's done in MRB, but the the key is to show that you did your part, right? So if I'm a leader and I say like, Hey, document that you've like dropped this off over at finance, like find a way to like document that appropriately so that when you build the case, you can show that. Right. So that's done Mm -hmm. over at MRB. Um, Another thing that I think is really important for people to know is when it comes to, you know, you see people that go for um, their, their disability review, you know, and just that process of some of the mm. things, I feel like that's really difficult to navigate. There's so many things. Um, MRB also holds like a big portion of that. And so again, there's like all these things that you want to like understand what happens over there, not to be an expert on it, just to know that it exists. And so um, you, you've heard of the BCMR, mm-hmm. right? That should be the last stop because that it's like a time machine, like where they're going to go back and like make something right. Um, but it is the last stop because once they decide, there's no more anybody else deciding. And so there's like 10 other boards that could make a decision on something. And then if you don't like that decision, you could then appeal to the BCMR. So try and like get something figured out by one of the other boards first. Um, and, and like medical, it would be one of those things. The only, the other one that I think is kind of like an unknown is um what we call, um, like if you had a maintainer who retires and they go to work for Airbus, they have to get approval to work for a foreign government. And that approval, like that paperwork flows through MRB. And so, right. Because that company is owned by a different country. Government. It, yes. Because okay. you can't draw your retirement and draw a paycheck from a foreign government at the same time without approval first. And it's not retroactive. This is all done, like, it's all in law. And so it just wasn't something that I was familiar with before. So you'd have to give all that money back. Wait. So not- like, if, if you don't know that you're working for Airbus for two years, and then if someone finally catches onto that, points it out, they, so you lose all that paycheck. You either give back the Airbus pay or you give back your retirement pay. Both are not good though. No, that's right. great to know. That's so whatever company you're working for, you, you, it would be very important to know if that was a foreign owned company. Correct. Um, wow. And you might yeah, not, I, I mean, you might just that. Not, not know because it's not like intuitive in the name that they're foreign, you know, owned. And so, right. um, you know, it's just things that I just didn't know until I got there. So there's just so many things like, you know, there's a chief in MRB, there's the chief in MR, like feel free to have them set up a Zoom call or, a, you know, some, you know, like they do briefings all over, have them come out and do like a professional development briefing to kind of like walk through all their boards and whatnot, you know, I mean, it's just so much great information. And so that's just kind of like a quick highlights reel of some things that I think people just didn't know about. Right. No, I love that. Helpful to take care of our service members. So I just wanted to like things like I just didn't know before. No, that I think that's all amazing things to point out. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure there are people that are going to be like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, pro tips for transition out of the military. Oh, right. So, so um, what, what, let's uh, run us through like when you retired and what phase you're currently at. Super. So I did my ceremony, um, in April and I am um, almost done with my skill bridge right now. And so I was really fortunate. I um, was supposed to actually be retired right now. And so because my person who replaced me didn't actually arrive until April, um, we were able to extend me just a little bit just so I could use my terminal leave. And I chose to use my terminal leave on a skill bridge program. So my recommendation for, I feel like transition is hard. Like you spent all this time, like we spend what, 10 to 13 weeks making you a uniform wearer. And then we give you like a week and tap to like make you a civilian. So, you know, you feel like, right. you, you feel like transition is just such, such an, an adjustment and I feel like it's hard. So um, the earlier you can start, the better. And so I think the recommendation is a year. And like, if you follow Mike Quinn at all, I think he says two years. Um, some people are really successful with this. Um, Scott Stalker has been wildly successful of doing all the work like two years out. He's been, he's very prepared for transition. I decided on my retirement, I think in January. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was a little behind. It's a smaller window that, that you had to work with. Right. right. And so, um, 
I would think just start early, right? And so um, a couple of things. Once, once you like think I might be schedule your appointments to like get your resources in the game, right? Um, and there's so many great resources out there to prepare us. So a couple of them that I found very helpful were the Commit Foundation. So Commit is like, um, I got assigned to a transition coach and then I got assigned to a coach who walked me through all these modules. Um, I had a book that I worked through kind of helping me design my life. Um, I'm working with ACP for a mentor. Um, I worked with a company to, I think, um, higher heroes org, one of them, um, to build my resume. I had a resume coach, all of these great resources available to me. Right. Um, just kind of like help me get that stuff done, get your medical appointments in. All of those things take a lot of time, by the way, you're still probably doing your job. Right. And by the way, just pause for one sec. You sent me all those resources that you just mentioned. So I'm, if anyone's listening, um, I will put those in the show notes just so people can like scroll down and and find it themselves. Yep. Fantastic resources that really helped me to commit foundation really helped me with like trying to be patient with like, don't be panicked, but like really truly design what I want to do, right? Align what my strengths are with what my purpose is with what I want to do and how to share that story. So um, the other thing about transition, I think is like being purposeful about making the connections. And so um, one of the really great things that I did make time for was the information interview. And so I reached out on, I, you know, sat down and made my, like started going through the list of people I knew and asked for 20 minutes of their time to do an information interview. So what that looked like was if, for example, if I reached out to you, Josh, this would sound like, Josh, do you have 20 minutes in the next two weeks for me to like, take a look at what you do? I'm in the middle of transition for when I am going to retire from the military, I'm not job hunting yet, but I am trying to figure out what I might want to do next. And I'd like to walk through what you do, what your day-to-day looks like and ask some questions about how your transition was from the military to what you're doing now. Right. Get, just getting that insight. Yeah. Right? Hearing like what their experience was, if they liked their current job, if they recommend it to you, what yep. their, what their life's, you know, what their lifestyle's like. Now that they're in that job, like these are all things that we have no idea about. That's right. And what their key performance um, indicators are, that kind of thing, right? What we think the future outlook might look like, um, that kind of thing. Every person said yes. And then I scheduled that for 20 minutes. I came prepared. I would stock their LinkedIn, you know, like, so I could be really prepared for asking the questions and keep it to 20 minutes. So I did about 40 of those to kind of like fine tune what I wanted to do. And so you know, that kind of helped me decide on my skill bridge opportunity. I'm um, almost done with that. I have about a month left of skill bridge. I've finished five certifications now um, in the last two months, and I've got one more certification to go. And I've been, um, wow. I know (laughs) Um, I've been working on um, just now started working with a client on like how to do a change management strategy. So I'm getting like some of that business exposure so transition, that. just, there's just so many pieces and layers to it that I think like the biggest thing is start early, layer in your appointments, make time to do the information interviews and make time for your appointments. Right. And so the earlier you start that, the better so that it's not overwhelming. Definitely. And, uh, their, their tap is expanded too. Like I, after I spoke with you, I just went over there to the uh, Airmen and Family Readiness Center. I was like, can I just get this stuff scheduled just to like uh, alleviate some of my anxiety? Yeah. And so, yeah, there was like, I think I signed up for like four different types of TAP. There's there's multiple ones out there. And the one that I'm, that's, I'm really looking forward to is the boots to business, like the entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. You know, that that definitely did not exist when I was an airman, that that class. Um, and so it has expanded quite a bit and I, and I am signed up now. Uh, over the coming six months for about four different types of classes. So that's I'm right. excited so about many, that. So many great resources now. And so, like I said, if you just have the inkling of I might retire, that's nothing that's going to hurt you from like getting those classes in early, right? Making the appointments to kind of like set you up for success, you know, Definitely. get your life insurance early, right? If you need it, you know, right. I heard there's also people that struggle with um, 
getting a VA loan, like they'll retire and then find out that they can't get a VA loan or something. Like you can only get it while you're still serving. There's something, there's something to that. Um, Cause a neighbor of mine just ran into that problem when he moved to uh, Oregon. I am not smart on that, but that's the first time that I have heard that. So. Well, I need to run that down for you then. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> this is summer. My kids love to, to pop in here. Hi, summer. Hi. We just had the first day of summer. Yep. We named her Summer because she's bright and and beautiful, and we love her smile, so we named her Summer. Oh, I love it. Okay, can you give me a minute? <laughs> she's going to change the world. She's got the best of me and her mother, so she's she's a sharp little girl. Um, okay, no, I think that's all great. How about emotionally, though? Um Wendy, did that did did that affect you at all? Like, oh, I'm not wearing the uniform anymore. Like your your so, OG friends, like Hope Skabitsky, y'all were just y'all were just changing the world together, and and now you're both not in the uniform now. Like, did that emotionally do anything to you? I think um I think everybody thought that I would really have a hard time, except for my friend Jay Keys. He's like, if Hope Skabitsky can retire, then like everybody can. <laughs> Good point. Right. I mean, she's like the most blue, like of anybody I know. Right. So, uh, I, I don't know. I, I haven't yet, but you know, you have to remember, I'm also a reservist, right? So I've actually had a civilian job in the past where I like, haven't been in uniform every day. So, mm. um, you know, maybe because I, I have had that experience before I left active duty in 2001 and mm-hmm. had a day job. So I don't know, maybe this is my second time of doing this. Right. So, um, I don't know. I don't think that has really hit me yet. I mean, I had a r- just truly wonderful retirement ceremony to close that chapter and it didn't feel like a funeral. It felt like a celebration of a wonderful career and just like a ready to start my chapter two. So I don't, I don't feel like it f- seemed like I was missing anything, you know, and I still get right. to do a lot of things that I am really passionate about with AFSA because I, you know, I care a lot about service members. So I, I still feel connected in that way. Yes. So. so that's our third topic, your involvement with AFSA. You're, you're one of the champions of AFSA. I am. Right. Yeah. So I was hoping to hear, you know, where your involvement was while you were wearing the uniform uh, and where you hope it goes as a civilian. Well, I'll tell you when I was, uh, so I came into service in the Navy. And then when I left active duty, I went into the Navy reserve. They didn't have a job for me. And so that's when I pivoted over to the air force reserve. So I only spent two months in the Navy reserve. Like they literally was just sitting around, not doing anything. And so I bounced from there over to McCord. Um, and McCord had this huge chapter. So I come into being an airman and, uh, you know, there wasn't like a reblue program or anything like that back in 2001 when I came into the Air Force Reserve. But my command chief, um, everybody came to AFSA. Like there's like 100 people in my chapter meeting, right? And the command wow. chief just signed me up as an AFSA member. And we actually had division conference like at McCord, you know? So oh like, my God. It was just, it was, it was huge, right? I met- It was thriving. Yeah, I met Chief Parrish at McCord. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. And so um, so like how you learn something is often how you think it's supposed to be, right? So I just thought that this is AFSA. This like you go to annual conferences, you go to division, like that's how it is, right? It was just this huge thing. Um, you know, I later PCS'd from Accord down to Travis, also a huge chapter, right? Like it's just Ryan. um really, really involved. And so it was just an expectation to always be involved. And so um, also this one, I kind of like went through that hard stuff and, um, AFSA was that family that was like, we've got you. And they, you know, like they gave me all these great opportunities to be, that's one thing I think I love about AFSA. Like you can be a slick sleeve airman and hold a leadership position in AFSA. Right. I mean, you could be the slick sleeve, anything like you, I mean, you, family matters, you, you know, you can, you can be, um, a, a, a significant other spouse of, of a service member you can, and hold a position, right. Um, you can be a Marine, you can be, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's universal. It is. And it's just like incredible opportunities for all ranks to hold like, and I don't know of another organization that just like got, got that kind of aperture. So, um, 
you know, the leadership was just so wonderful to me, lifelong friends, you know, I, some of the people I met at icebreakers and are just Chris Dodd. I met with like at an icebreaker sitting next to me and he's just, you know, who are you? What do you do? You know, and it looks like my family, you know? Wow. So, um, so that's just kind of like how I got introduced to AFSA and, um, you know, started getting involved and, you know, like sometimes people say like, well, I don't, I don't, I am a shop of like only one. I don't get to do this thing or that thing or whatnot. And so when I was like, well, I want my record to stand out. AFSA was the place where I could lead and do something, you know, where I could be involved when I didn't have an opportunity to lead someplace else in my organization, if that makes sense, you know? No, absolutely. Like you, you might not have all the opportunities right in front of you, but if you go to something as large as AFSA and everything that they're getting into, you're going to have an opportunity to shine there. Like you can kind of pave that path for yourself yeah, while working just, with AFSA. You know, it had like that really great family atmosphere. There are so many people that have this great depth of experience, right? Because it's just got that wide range of, it's not just a, a small niche of the population, right? And so, um, I mean, it was just, it's just wonderful. And so um, eventually I ended up wearing them now on the board of directors as the uniform services trustee. And so it really dovetailed nicely with being up in the NCR and being in the Pentagon and, um, you know, being a voice with, you know, um, some of the senior leaders. And so some of the big projects that we kind of like made a lot of progress with were like making sure TRICARE had some like equivalent benefits between the regions, um, you know, addressing some of like the difficult things like with COLA, um, you know, some of those big things that AFSA members would bring up and something would come to my attention. And it was just an easy ask to like make sure that it got addressed and then taken care of. And so, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, the TRICARE one just boggled my mind that in some areas, something was covered in some areas it wasn't. Right. Yeah. yeah that was wild. So, you know, that's, uh, it just it's like the, between the headquarters staff and then the actual chapters in the divisions, taking care of our, our uniformed members and their families has just been an extension of who I am. Right. And so I'll be really sad to leave the uniform services trustee position um, and turn that over. But now that I'm retiring, it's, um, it will just, it will, that's the natural progression of things. So, um, I'll be moving along on that seat as well. So I'll actually be running for a new position at, at summit this year. Oh, that's amazing. So the summit this year, it's in August. Um, it's in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you're, you're leaving this old position, right? Where you're the uniform trustee. So you're, you're passing the torch there, but there's this other opportunity as a civilian, which you can, you know, kind of put your name in the hat for. Can you run us through what that is? Oh, so, I mean, you can, there's all kinds of things and AFSA you can be involved in, but like, um, for example, you know, family members can run, um, for a position to, there's the family affairs trustee, right. Family matters trustee. Um, I, probably wouldn't run for that just because I'm not as familiar with that platform, but you could, right? And so I'll actually be running for the um, Retired and Veterans Affairs trustee position. Um, that would be new for me, but I spent a lot of time working with legislative requests and things like that in my previous position. And so I feel like I um, am at least smart enough on the bureaucratic processes and some of the legislative proposals that, you know, hopefully I could add value in that arena as well um, and still be taking care of our our veteran population, our retiree population, and our families too. So it would be something I'd be very passionate about, and it would still keep me really affiliated with AFSA, but I'd, I'll always be a part of the AFSA family. <laughs> so how, when when you go for this role, can you run us through how that process works? Oh, yeah. Like how, I mean, how you get picked for it? How does that go down? Yeah. So, um, so through the chapters, you know, like I mean, if you go to chapter meetings at all, you can kind of like really be informed on how um, all of our nomination processes work and everything. And so you submit a candidacy letter to AFSA and then at summit um, there's, you, you'll see the schedule for summit. It seems really long because there's the AFSA business. And then there's also like the, um, like the, the PEDS part of it, right? Where the professional conferences or the ELCs, right? And so you see like recruiters are there or the, um, it was, Career Advisors has a new name now, they're ADAs, Airman Development 
something I forgot. Could, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? It's it's what used to, the artists formerly known as career advisors, like right. they have a breakout. Recruiters have a breakout. First sergeants have a breakout, you know, mm-hmm. and so they have like, you know, all these things. And so that's a couple of days. And then there's also like the big stage events, right? So there's all this professional development that happens. It's like the premier enlisted professional development opportunity for our Air Force. You get so many heavy hitters that come in there. In the AFSA business, there's elections that happen during that time. There's also things that happen with voting on um, a number of different platforms, like we might be changing bylaws or things like that, the AFSA business for the AFSA membership. And so like as, as an AFSA member, you can t- attend the, the AFSA business part of it. And then the chapters have certain delegates that then that's how, that's your voting power. So really like anybody can then run and you just submit your candidacy letter and go for it. So this essentially your people can vote for you at the summit this August in Dallas. If they attend that, these chapters, that's one of these, you know, voting papers that they're going to turn in. It's going to say Wendy T on one of those. Sort of. You, you actually, it's very formal. Like they, it's closed door. Right. And then they come oh, up wow. to the microphone and they'll say like, this chapter, this many delegates to this person, this many delegates to that person, you know? Um, wow. You know, yeah. I've never seen that part of it. So I'm, I'm yeah. kind of fascinated by that. Um, and I don't think personally, I don't think there's anyone better than you. Um, <laughs> and I say that just because you were the uniform trustee. You've been in AFSA your whole career. You've worked at the Pentagon. You've seen the legislative side. Now you're a retiree. Like you're kind of the perfect person to roll into something like that. You know what I mean? There will, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of great candidates or, you know, it just, uh, it is something I'm passionate about and we'll see how it all shakes out. But I will tell you a funny story about how those delegates go, because, um, I was not the chapter president when I, the first time I saw all of this happening and my chapter president didn't show up to, and it's closed door. Right. And so once they close the doors, there's like a, a master at arms that, like stands outside, like you can't come in. Right. Oh, wow. And so, um, he didn't make it in. And so they were like, (laughs) so they were like, you're going to have to go up there and do the delegate count. And I was like, what? Um, and I don't know what you say. And I don't know. (laughs) Oh my God. Now I'm relying trial by fire. So I'm relying on the people, um, from another chapter who were telling me, and I was like, are they punking me right now? Are they actually telling me what I'm supposed to say? Are they like, like, is this hazing? Like, (laughs) I know. I wasn't sure if it was like, right. If it was legit or not, you know, like it, right. so I was so scared, like holding my paper and like shaking up at the microphone. <laughs> so yes. but you got through it though. I did. Yeah. They were, they were actually really being kind to me, but I wasn't sure. So I was so scared. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so I, here's what kills me. People don't know about AFA or AFSA. Or, or go or get to go to those conferences until much later in their career. I, I, I hear that over and over again. And it happened to me. Um, but I got to tell you, when I finally went, which was last year, that was the first one I've ever been to. I, know, and I got to po- I got to podcast at it. But, you know, I call it the Air Force Super Bowl because all the team players are there. Right. It's like the Air Force Pro Bowl, like all, the best of the best are there. And you can talk to them and like like candidly, like you can you can just, you know, get to know them as a person and the, the connections that I made there, the friendships that I made there, the, the stuff that I heard just at the conference in general was just like mind blowing to me. That It is the premier professional development opportunity for our enlisted members, because it's where else in that short of a time frame do you get all those heavy hitters? Right. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Right. I just, it is so impressive. And I always, it really does hurt my heart to hear that people don't get an opportunity to go because I feel like I'm always advocating for AFSA and for some wings just do a better job, right? Like where I grew up is how I thought it was. And so, um, when I got to Travis again, it just depends on like whether or not that leadership team thinks it's important to go. Right. And so when I got there, there was even a a point in time where that leadership was doubling people up in rooms to double the capacity of how many people they sent. Right. That's amazing. Right. And so like, and people were not like upset about like, even if they were a master sergeant that they were sharing a room because that was two people that were going to get to go. You know what I mean? Right. So, it meant more um, to them to allow these other people to, to see it right. and experience right. it. Mm-hmm. And so, um, 
you know, and, and then just, I mean, once you kind of like get bought in like that, I feel like those chapters work really hard to hustle throughout the year to fundraise enough to make sure they can send the max amount of people they can each year. Right. And so I, it, cause AFSA doesn't, I can tell you this, AFSA doesn't make money hosting that conference. You know, it's wow. not like a, it's not like a fundraiser for them. This is our give back to the service. Right. And, so. and it's a hell of a give back. Um, you know, I had my life before that conference and my life after there's two different lives. <laughs> like it, yeah. it's, it literally changed my life with the, the people that I met, the relationships that I formed, it changed the trajectory of, of where I'm headed in life for, you know, for the better. It's incredible. I met a Marine in 2010 at, um, at AFSA because that particular AFSA, they were bringing in sister, sister service first sergeants to kind of compare how they're different than the first sergeants, um, in the air force. And, and actually we just were messaging on LinkedIn today because he's a vice president of a company now. And so, you know, I'm like considering what my future will look like. And so I was like, Hey, I'm in Florida. You know, this is 13 years later, you know? Wow. 13 uh, years later. Unbelievable. And I always remember him in particular because, um, chief McCoy pointed him out. So the former's panel happens like on the last morning and uh, I've got to be honest, some people just miss it. Cause it's like eight o'clock in the morning and they're like, whatever late. And so they don't show up and it's the former chief master sergeants of the air force, you know? Right. And so Pieces like, you gotta remember, like back, back in 2010, mm-hmm. there was like lots of them up on that panel, you know? And so, right. um, you know, I just can't believe that people would miss it. And so there's this Marine sitting in the audience, right. Who doesn't know anybody from anybody. And there he is. And so chief McCoy was kind of like picking on him because chief McCoy's daughter-in-law daughter was married to a Marine or something. Yeah. Daughter was married to a Marine. So he was kind of like picking on him. And I thought it was so impressive that he managed to drag himself out to this former's panel when like the people who should care about it, you know, were asleep. asleep. Right. So, um, wow. I always thought that was super impressive that he came in. So he was in a breakout that I was in for, um, for Sergeant stuff. And so I had made mention of it. And so we, here it is 13 years later and we're still in contact. And so I, you know, I saw something that he posted where they were number one in the country for his business. And so I had congratulated him and I was like, by the way, I'm retiring now. So if you have connections in Florida, <laughs> <laughs> right. So 13 years later, you still got that connection. <laughs> Well, with that, with that power. guest, it is your superpower. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Um, wow. That's unbelievable. So last few questions for you, Wendy, uh, regarding AFSA, let's say you do get picked for this position. Let's say it all works out. The votes go your way. You now fill that role. Yep. What does that look like for you? Like, and for AFSA, what, what are you going to bring to that role? So hopefully it would be more communications on like the legislative proposals that AFSA is working on at that specifically apply to that retiree and veteran community. And so communicating that, advocating for it, making sure that the, that the body is aware of what's happening and making sure that we're getting after those issues, being the ear for that community to then channel that to headquarters so that we can then leverage some of that toward Congress, you know, saying like, we want these issues pushed for. So kind of like just shifting the perspective from the uniformed wearer to the veteran or the retiree population. And who better to pick than you? You're the, you're the connector. That's like your call sign, right? You're the connector. You connect people. Um, You, you, you're the perfect person for this job. So I am, I don't think, I don't know if I can vote or not, but I'm going to, I'm going (laughs) to, you know, at least I'll be there cheering you on. Uh, Thanks Josh. But um, I, I really can't, honest to God, can't picture anyone better for that position than you. Um, And I know you will do so much positive change and bring your special unique gifts that I know you have to this role. And I can't wait to see what happens when you get it. Not if I'm going to say when you get it. We'll put it out in the universe now. So in between now and then, if people need some help, like with connecting between the MR assets and the field, I am available. If people need help with transition, I am available because like I said, nobody should ever feel alone in their walk. And so, you know, I don't, I don't want anybody to feel like it's too much of a reach. So. Absolutely. And how can people find you on Instagram? I, 
I am on Instagram. Anything that you see on there was probably posted by somebody else since I don't really know how to use it because I'm old. And so I also have Facebook. I also have LinkedIn. I also am still on the global for a little bit. Um, and so like you can drop okay. all of my information in there, yeah. my cell phone number, when you drop the rest of those things in there, like I'm not hard to find. Awesome. There's a couple other people who pretend to be me and have my picture on there. But if you see that you have other people in common, that's probably the one that's me. Yeah. When, when you got those uh, pretenders out there, that's how you know you made it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I got somebody who sent me a thing saying, were you hacked? And I said, nope, I wasn't hacked. That's just somebody who's stealing my pictures. <laughs> You got to have that double authentication on your profile these days. You really do. You got to have that. Um, okay, Wendy, I got to say you are one of a kind. Um, the love and care that you've you know shown the airmen and and the AFSA family um, is just unparalleled. You know, have what you've brought to the table, and you're still here even as a civilian with AFSA still being there for us in your own unique special way. So I just wanted to thank you for that and leave the floor to you if you had any final thoughts. I, you know what, I am just so glad to see people who are pursuing their passion like you, right. And, and doing so many great things for other people in uniform to recognize that it's okay to be who you are. Right. And to, to pursue your purpose and to see how successful you've been in that, I think gives hope to so many other people. It sure does to me. Right. And especially like when I say the commit foundation was really like it, it's helpful to like help you design what you are supposed to do. It was really helpful for me to slow down and think, what do I want to do? And how does it align to what I, you know, what my purpose is um, instead of just feeling like I have to do something and get a paycheck. It was more of a, like, no, take pause and think about what you want to do. And that that's what, where your greatness will come, you know? And Absolutely. so I think seeing the success that you've had with helping people, you know, deliver a message, I think is your gift. And, you know, I, I love to see people be able to find what they're meant to do and be, and have success with it. And I think it gives everybody else hope, you know? And so what better example do we have than to see people have success? So. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny you say that because literally today um, I ran into a good friend of mine, um, Sergeant Phillips, and she was like, Hey, you know, someone's asking for your information. Like I, this happens all the time where someone's like, the longer I go on, the more people behind me are trying to also do that right because it, yeah. it means something to them and they want to be a part of it and so like i can't tell you how happy i've been to like trailblaze that path for them you know towards the end of my service that i've kind of opened this door for these amazing creative airmen behind me to then carry that on so it's true it's true like when you when people say all the time i think when i think about being a minority um like as a woman or as a you know asian um, as a reservist, I was often the only in a room. And I think um, that what that led to for me was more opportunity because I was remembered, you know. Um, you're I unique. Think, well, I think that whenever you're doing a good job, it's magnified, you know, and so when you are a minority, so when you're in something that is like different, you're a minority, you know, like if you're the shortest kid on the basketball team, you're different, you know. Right. And so if you're having great success, you're remembered. And so here you are and doing something that is different and having great success, so you're remembered. And so then once people can see it, then they believe that they can do it. That's beautiful. Wow. All right, everyone. I hope you had an amazing time talking or listening to me talk to Wendy. We talked about lessons learned from her time at the Pentagon. She gave us pro tips to transition out the military and her passion for AFSA and how it changed her life. So if you are still listening, we want to thank you for tuning in. This was the hero's journey of Wendy T. And we're out. Oh, yeah, we got to do the heart. I know, right? <laughs> we got to do that. We got to do the heart at the end. That's, that's her right, thing. That's right. That's right. That's right.